And for me, that's what I find so fascinating about all this is, you know, I speak to businesses now and I teach them how to take all of this stuff that you and I have such a love for through the game of basketball and apply these same principles. Because anything we're talking about now with hoops, you can, as you said, you can apply to relationships, you can apply to business, you can apply to, it's all the same type of stuff. Sir. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Good to see you, brother. Yeah. So we share something in common. We do. Both love to hoop. Absolutely. Yeah. Or at least love the game. I don't play much anymore. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, hoops is, uh, it's been a major staple of my entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got your Larry Bird shirt on got right to. now. Got to represent. His head is actual size. <laughs> I know it which is. Which is perfect. Mustache <laughs> intact. Yeah. yeah. Kids today don't know how good he was. Yeah. I mean, he was See, I was, was a Magic an Johnson fan. Yeah. So, so I think in my mind, my dis temperament and dislike for him for sure probably made me underestimate him, but i always knew he was a worthy foe yeah absolutely and even magic says that yeah yeah bird got it done yeah but injuries cut it all short i think he could have been even better and that's something that like you know players were really good then but we didn't know shit about the body like we do now we didn't no. know shit about fueling athletes we no. didn't know shit about like the training the performance nor really the mindset principles, which is probably why you had such a, I guess it's still one of the major separators, you know, because kind of everybody's getting, not everybody, but most people are getting the information about how to care for the body because yes. trainers are getting up to speed and, you know, even the teams working with us here at Onnit and Absolutely. Exos and stuff like that. But then the mental side of the game, that is still a big differentiator. Yeah. And it's know? the big differentiator in everything we do. Right. I mean, that's the one thing. Yeah. That, that, that's why sport will cross over and transfer into anything. But can you imagine? I mean, I would have loved to have seen what Bird ate on a regular basis. You think he did any training? <laughs> Do you think he even bent down to try to touch his toes to pretend to stretch? I bet he just jumped on the court and yeah. started getting loose by shooting. And Maybe just like kept one going. of those billet holes. Yeah, stretches, absolutely. Just like a couple loose yes. ones. And the then... cable guy, uh, Jim Carrey, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, doing yeah. the suicides real quick. But yeah, <laughs> I bet that'd probably be it. And, yeah. But yet still played at a high level. So that That's part's remarkable. Yeah. And like, what could he have done with more explosive training? Of course. And like the faster first step and then made people respect right. that a little bit more so that his jumper was a little bit cleaner, you know, right. just like, who knows? But that wasn't around then. So he was still doing the best with what he had at yep. the time. Yep. Now today, if you're not doing it, there's no excuse. It's simply apathy, you know, right. because all of the tools and the knowledge and the training is there. So if you're not doing it, that's on you. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that, you know, like the level of the level of the game itself has just evolved. And people always yes. have these de uh, debates like, oh, what if so-and-so was back? I was like, yeah, yeah, they were really dominant then. Yeah. But you got to understand how big, fast, strong, lean, lanky, you know, like ferocious all athletes in all sports are now. It's, it's tenfold. It's you know, amazing. It's just another, it's another level. And I think the I think the stars would cancel each other out. I think if you go back 10, 15, 20, 30 years, those stars would still play today. But mm -hmm. what I think it's it's the depth that has increased. The the 15th man on the Golden State Warriors today is 20 times better than the 15th man, even on the Showtime Lakers back when you were a kid. Like yeah. that, the level has gone up. A lot of that's with the international play. I mean, just the game has grown so much because of those guys, you know, yeah. with, with our age bracket, with Bird and Larry and Jordan, they took the game to a global level and changed everything, but- yeah and how have you seen so that's obvious it's really obvious to see that on the physical side but how have you seen that translate to the mental side of the game because you know even when i was growing up you could talk about being on fire like being in the zone but nobody really understood that nobody was no. talking about flow state nobody no. was talking about some of these you know neurotransmitter patterns that yeah. were coming up that you know are associated with being in the zone yes you know or like actually playing at the, at the top level no one was actually quantifying anything no. there so it's just kind of words absolutely and now they are so now folks can train for it i mean right. all of the nba staffs have a mental skills coach or someone that's going to help with that that portion of it because they realize it's it's all of this stuff and it'll be interesting to see what's next mm -hmm. i mean you guys are on the cutting edge of all that so you'll probably predict it as much as anyone but it's it's pretty phenomenal just to see where it's going yeah so like uh, there was a study that i that i read about in which they were they hooked people up um to brain scans and uh -huh. then they would measure them as they were shooting free throws and as they would make free throws they would maintain an alpha state which is kind of that that flow state and when they would miss one they would get a spike in beta state beta frequency which is associated with kind of stress mm -hmm. and like kind of being out of the present focus and i think that's um 
you know interestingly like that's something that you really start to learn through sport absolutely like you learn when you can release and it's this kind of momentum confidence game but if you can actually translate that so, so when i talk to fighters like you got to get a fighter particularly you can't let them work into the game you know you can't right. like hope that they make the first shot or land the first punch like no. you got to get there not in fighting you can't. No, you got to get there <laughs> you got to get there on the walk yes you know so it's it's about talking about that and i'm sure it's kind of the same for you it's not wait it's not having your players wait for oh yeah i sunk my first two threes now i'm in the game you know like you, you can't wait for that it's too random be ready because you're not gonna have time to get ready exactly so you have to be in that especially state. if you're coming off the bench too yeah. you know like you're coming off the bench you can't wait to make a few shots no you got to come in there and perform that's fin- I-, I never had seen that study that's pretty interesting when i was on talking to kyle this morning i told him a story about the first time i had met kobe bryant back in 2007 um what i didn't tell him was at that Skills Academy, Stephen Curry was actually one of the college counselors, and it was after his freshman year at Davidson, uh, which is before he blew up. No mm. one knew who Stephen Curry was after his freshman year. Not even the camp, the coaches at this camp. They all just called him Dell's son because his dad played in the NBA. Um, but I remember there was a few things really remarkable about him. But the, uh, the most impressive thing was at the end of the first workout, and we were there for two workouts a day for three days. It was a mini camp with Kobe. And he came over to me just based on proximity, and I had on one of those shirts that said coach on the back, and, and Steph said, will you rebound for me because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish five free throws in a row. I don't know how many of your listeners play basketball, yeah. but swishing five free throws in a row is an incredibly high standard. That's I mean, really that's, hard. I mean, I had a high standard, I thought, when that was I had to make three three-pointers in a row before I would leave the court. And, and that I've is a high standard. before. Yeah, but that's an but incredibly that's high standard. But way easier than five but, but, but swishes. I, yes, and I remember there were a few times where he would swish four in a row. He'd hit a little bit of the rim on the fifth one, so it still goes in. Uh-huh. He's still five for five. He's mathematically perfect, but yeah. that wasn't good enough for him. He'd start over until he'd swish five. And I don't think it ever took him longer than maybe 12, 15 minutes to swish five in a row. But it's funny, when you just brought up that study, that reminded me that, I mean, he was conditioning himself to be in that state. He was conditioning himself to do that and to not accept anything less. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the reasons I think he'll go down in history as the best shooter we've ever seen, despite the fact I'm wearing a bird shirt, is his ability just to move on to the next shot. I mean, it doesn't happen often. He could miss 20 shots in a row, He'll still beg for the ball when there's two seconds left and the game's tied because he always believes that the next shot's going in. And that's a hard mindset to get to. That's, you know, and that's something that you see even in the greatest of great players sometimes is deficient. You know, I mean, I think LeBron James will obviously is one of the greatest basketball players of all times. But I think that's something that I think not just me, but a lot of people have kind of noticed, especially earlier in his career, there'd be times where he'd be like, yeah, maybe I don't want to take this final shot. Yes. You know, and like that's not something you see in Steph. No. Now it doesn't mean Steph's better. You know, right. LeBron obviously has other characteristics that are, you know, excelling and phenomenal, but it is a very unique thing, even amongst the elite of the elite. Yes. You know, to have that like, oh yeah, the best chances for the team are when I have the ball. Yes. You know, it's that unflappable confidence, even if you've gone one for ten that night. And that only comes from preparation. Yeah. You know, I mean, demonstrated performance. That's what it comes from. When you know that you've swished five free throws in a row every day of your life since you were 10 years old, you're pretty cool going to the line. Like you're going to be fine, mm-hmm. especially if you've done some of the other, you know, mental practices and stuff you talk about, about living in the present moment, you know, that's what it comes down to. But that's yeah. where I think the game is is evolving to the point where now it's the cerebrals every bit as important as the physical. I mean, mm-hmm. the physical is just not going to be good enough anymore. What are some of the things you do to help people get into the present moment? Because as I was saying, you know, you can wait till you make a couple shots and then you can kind of really be in the flow, you know, or wait till you get ri- get in rhythm in the ring and then you're in the flow. But how do you get there prior to any activity? Well, th- there's, there's three steps that I talk to folks all the time. The first is the one I just mentioned, which is you just focus on the next play. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything about the one that just happened. Whether you made a three-pointer or you dribbled it off your foot, It's over now and you have to move on to the next play. And especially in a game like basketball, you know, you miss a wide open layup and you're in your feelings and you're pouting and you're trotting back with bad body language. Your man just scored an easy layup on the other end because you chose not to be present for just a few seconds. Can't afford that. Uh, The other is to put all of your focus on the only two things you have control over, which is your effort and your attitude, you know, live in your effort and your attitude. Uh, Effort I always find incredibly fascinating because People admit and acknowledge that giving a good effort is a choice, like you choose to work hard. 
but that means by default, you also choose not to work hard. Mm. There has to be another side to that coin. But you know, you ask any normal human being, if you call them out and hold them accountable on why they didn't give a good effort, they make excuses. Yeah. I was tired, I was this, I was that. You still had the choice whether or not to give your best effort. And, and these guys condition themselves to give their best effort. I mean, no one does it 100% of the time, you wouldn't be human, but I mean, they're, they're almost yeah. infallible with that. And then same thing with attitude. Attitude, in my opinion, is all about feedback. You know, I, I try to look at, life. I mean, life's the most important thing we have, so I don't want to trivialize it, but really life is nothing but just a series of at-bats. Like this podcast right now is just another at-bat. Uh, you had lunch before, that's just an at-bat and everything gives us feedback, mm -hmm. you know, internally and externally, and we get feedback. And what we choose to do with that feedback determines how successful we'll be. So no matter what type of feedback you get, you can use it in a way that serves you and moves you forward. So when Steph misses a shot, he's able to quickly analyze why he missed that shot and he'll make sure that he'll make a correction. I mean, it's a little easier on a free throw when you're gonna replicate two shots, sure. but you don't see Steph Curry miss short on a free throw. He sure as hell ain't missing again short. Right. He makes an adjustment because <laughs> he uses and processes that feedback. And then the third pillar is just focusing on the process. You know, Don't worry about the wall, focus on laying each brick as perfectly as you can. And if you lay each brick perfectly, the wall's probably gonna take care of itself. Yeah. And if you can do those three things consistently, I think you're more apt to be in the present moment. Yeah, I think all that makes sense. And so let's let's go back to each one of these. So I think there's yes. lessons and things to expand on all of them. Um, you know, the first one is, I think one of the problems is, is that coaches and the world reinforces the fear of doing your best and still failing and then them judging you. Like you could be giving an all out effort, diving on the floor, bleeding. But you know, with my high school coach, you miss a shot that you normally would make, which is statistically going to happen. You get pulled out of the game, Yeah. right? So like, it doesn't matter that anything else other than the statistical probability that every once in a while you're gonna miss a layup. Mm -hmm. And then, but when the penalty for that accident <laughs> is severe and you get embarrassingly pulled out of the game and yep. ridiculed well it's going to pattern even more fear of and that it fear is, is going to pull you out of the present moment even more and it's funny that people are just kind of now waking up to this a little bit like i remember i've told this story in, in the in my course go for your win but it was a really impressive moment where pete carroll was squaring off against uh, mike mccarthy so seahawks green bay packers yep. and it was the playoffs i think leading up to the super bowl and Russell Wilson was just having a dog of a game, like really rough game, three interceptions, something like that. Every time he would throw an interception, he, you know, Pete Carroll would be there and like clap him, smack him on, like, come on, man, we got yep. this, I believe in you. And just believed in him the whole way. Packers were way out ahead. And then the Seahawks started to make a run. And as they started to make a run, you saw on the other side, Mike McCarthy getting more aggressive and more uh -huh. angry and more like fired up you know, in the wrong way and instilling his team with fear, whereas yep. Pete Carroll was just enthusiasm kind of the whole way. And it ended up, you know, with a kind of like this turning point moment was they needed an onside kick because they were that far behind. Kicker kicks the ball. They're sure-handed tight end. This guy Bostic fumbles the ball. Clearly, he's not trying to do that. Right. And then, so the the, uh, the Seahawks get the ball back. Well, they still got to go whatever, 50 yards, to, and they got to score a touchdown. Yeah. So instead of like firing up his defense, he goes there and he just starts lighting up that guy Bostic, like oh, in man. his face, like talking shit, like how could you, what the fuck's wrong with you, blah, blah, blah. Like he meant to do that. Right, of course. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And like that's going to help him the next time. I know. You know, and like his defense didn't need the same pep talk, like, hey, here we go. They yeah. got the ball. Yeah. No fucking problem. We've right. stopped teams better than this before a million times. And you're going to go out there and you're going to fucking stop them this time. Absolutely. Right. And so like that whole framework thing was, you know, just he was having an off moment or that's just part of his old, old school mentality. And what happens, of course, well, Seahawks fucking march right through that, march right through that defense, like a knife through hot butter yep. and score Absolutely. and game over season's over, you know? And I really feel like that was like a key thing where that coach mentality was able to change the outcome of the game and the thing is all right most of us don't have actual coaches now but we're all our own internal coach so we can have our own positive internal coach and we fuck something up in a relationship in in work and whatever absolutely we can either be pete carroll or mike mccarthy we can either tell ourselves how horrible we are yes or get ourselves fired up learn the next learn one. the lesson and move on yeah. but you i mean that's the crazy part but i mean what you just said is what 
our whole society does, which is value outcomes instead of the process. Yep. I mean, you know, as a basketball player, it's either a good shot or a bad shot the moment it's taken. It has nothing to do with whether it goes in. Yeah. It has to do with time and score and the player taking it and their range and all of that stuff because you can clearly miss a great shot to take. That was yeah. the best shot our team could have gotten and we missed it. Or you can th throw in and make an awful shot and yet we still reward that. I mean, I have young kids, so they're playing basketball now and it's the parents do what all parents do. They clap when the kids make a shot. They don't clap when they don't. So we're, once again, we're reinforcing outcome. the outcome, which is the wrong thing to do to little kids. So now they're thinking, well, I only get praise when I make the shot. And that's, that's not what should be going through their mind. It's a good or a bad shot. The moment it's taken it has nothing to do with whether it goes in. Now, mm -hmm. statistically, you'll make a higher percentage of good shots, which is why we want you to take them. But that's, that's a problem. I mean, I think uh, Pete Carroll, any coach that goes over and pats their player on the back after they, they made a mistake. As long as it's not from apathy or lack of effort, right. which it wasn't. Right. Like you just said so perfectly. Because that's the thing that yeah, you're able to control. Didn't try to fumble <laughs> no. the ball. No, fuck no. no. What does he's he want to do? His, be embarrassed yeah. in front of everybody? Letting his like, teammates down? Everything. No. He was trying his best. Absolutely. So fucking give that guy a hug. Yes. <laughs> like don't, don't and, like and tell, him up. and tell the defense, look, our teammate, our brother just made a mistake that we know yeah. he feels awful about. We've got his back. We're going to make sure that doesn't define our season. We've got his back. We're going to get a stop because mm -hmm. we know how much this meant to him. Yeah. That would have been, yeah. And, and again, he's an, he's an NFL head coach. So, you know, he- Obviously done a lot of great things. He has. You know? so And but, won a lot of Super Bowls, whatever. I'm not trying to talk shit on him, but I just, this was an observation of a moment. And we all have but it, moments. But it happens, can... it happens a lot. Yeah. And, that's, and we all do it to ourselves just ruthlessly. Of course. You know, it was interesting. Like, so one of my biggest sports moments in basketball was I got called up. We had a top 25 nationally ranked high school team and had Chris Mim, who was a center who yeah, played of course. in the NBA for a while, had this guy, Luke Axel played for Texas and Kansas. Yep. And so two like big time marquee players. Um, Mim was like a seven foot center, even in high school. So I got called up from the JV and this was right after a big ankle injury too. Oh. So I like got an ankle injury right at the start of the start of the season, came back, played a tournament, just shredded whoever I was playing on the, on the JV side. And yep. then the coach called me up cause they needed some outside shooting to kind of keep the pressure off these collapsing two, three zones on our big seven footer. So calls me up and really the coach, you know, he was super old school. And basically he was like, I'm gonna call you up. You're gonna shoot a three. If you make it, you can get to stay on varsity. You miss it, you don't. I was like, all right, sweet. Glad you, you know, didn't like, add any external yeah, pressure to exactly. you. Exactly, like I'm not worried about being a Californian moving to Texas and no. this is my first time on a big Texas high school sports venue where we get hundreds, sometimes thousands of people watching our fucking basketball games and it's in the papers and it's announced on the fucking PA system at the school. And he put you know? pressure on top of pressure for <laughs> yeah, you. Right. That was, that was a anyway, thoughtful but, gift. But anyway, Anyway, so you know, I remember that moment where he called my name, and I knew it was coming, and and that walk out, just the heartbeat, and I I knew then I'd played enough basketball. Like the first thing I have to do is make physical contact with somebody. Yes, like because I've so I got so much. You got the jitters, man. And Absolutely. Jitters. So like, bump somebody pretty hard, either on a screen or just as they're moving through to set a screen. You know, make some physical contact. Not enough to draw a foul or anything, but yep. enough to like, okay. So did that and the ball goes and again collapsing two three zone there's always that spot on the wing yep you know so i just set myself up there point guard drives you know the defense kind of collapses to him kicks it to me i shoot the shot and it was like the most slow motion i bet thing that i've ever seen and it goes in and oh. then just to feel my audience go you know go crazy i've never oh. had a fan base like that yeah. even jv games is like it's like seven people for a jv game wow. or like 700 for a varsity game yeah it's a big difference then I got so excited, right? Yeah. So the ball goes down the next time and I get it in the corner and I just wing like an air ball that I goes bet. like five just feet. Just way too excited. Too far because yeah. I was just so fucking fired up. Absolutely. Call me, I got pulled out of the game after that. Got it back in again because at least I made my first one and then was able to sink another shot. So I went another three. So I went two for three that night and that started the season. But it was just, it was really interesting watching how, you know, my life changed based on, something that wasn't really in my control and, and looking when i look back on that sure i'd shot a lot of threes i didn't leave the court until i made three yep. threes and all awesome. of that contributed all of that was there but it was also just kind of like these one of these moments where you feel like in that time i was just i had like help or something like i was just like in 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 flow or in in the grace of the universe like that was part of part of my path was to play on that team for sure for whatever reason and even looking back i don't say like i made that shot 
it's just weird how I how I look at that now. It's like, oh yeah, that shot was made. Yeah. And that shot was made because it was supposed to be made. And then <laughs> in like remarkable a really how quickly weird, it can change way, too. Yeah. Because then you said a mere few oh, seconds yeah. later, few you seconds later. landing in the third row of the bleachers. No. And <laughs> yeah, so think about that. Like that's that's remarkable. Yeah. But but our, as coaches, I mean, the job should have been to make that process as as easy for you to eliminate as many sure. distractions, not add sugar on top of sugar and say, you make this or else. I mean, that's the last thing that you'd want to tell, especially somebody young, you yep. know, they don't know. Yep. But that's, you know, and for me, that's what I find so fascinating about all this is, you know, I speak to businesses now and I teach them how to take all of this stuff that you and I have such a love for through the game of basketball and apply these same principles. Because anything we're talking about now with hoops, you can, as you said, you can apply to relationships, you can apply to business, you can apply, to, it's all the same type of stuff. Yeah, you can have that same fear mentality as a boss. So Absolutely. If someone makes a mistake and, and misses something, you know, you're going to fire them or you're going to yes. like berate them publicly or whatever when they're trying their best, working hard, exactly. you know, doing things. Yeah, all right, if they're careless or lazy or whatever, then, right. you know, get on their butt a little bit. Of course. That's fine. Yeah. But we do the same thing. We have this result focus. Oh, well, that campaign didn't work or this thing. And then people right. are playing out of fear. Then they hate what they're doing. Absolutely. Because, you know, that that coach that I was talking about didn't, no matter how good our teams were, they we never won a playoff game. He yeah. never won a playoff game the whole time he was there. Interesting. The reason why is because he was so ruthless on the players that, and and people hated playing. Yep. And it was a mix because we loved the game and of we course. loved our school and we loved our teammates but we hated practicing so much. We hated that there was this appeal to the season ending for yes. one, because like, oh, we lose this game. It's a pressure release. Whew, yeah. We don't have to deal with this, this guy can be fucking yelling at me maniac no more. Yeah. anymore, right? How sad is that? And two, by by leading up his own pressure that he put on himself, because yeah. it's really just a mirror of the way that they treat themselves. You know, when Mike McCarthy fucks up, he treats himself just the same way he treats Bostic. And when yep. my coach fucked up, I'm sure he treated himself the same way as he treated right. our team, you know, came from a military background and whatever. But that's not healthy either. That's not healthy, like, yeah. You got to show yourself some grace and some yeah, compassion. Exactly. So what would he do leading up to the game? Well, we would have double practices and yeah. like double work and then like double fucking suicides leading up. So our legs were just shot before all our big games. Yep. So I was like, thanks coach. Like I can't even right. jump today. You know, like this is great. I'm glad we stayed up till midnight running sprints. Exactly. For what reason again? I don't know. You know, and, and so it built this kind of negative feedback loop, Absolutely. which was really unfortunate. And I think one of the secrets to on its success and my success here is that I realized that to do anything well, you got to love, you got to love, you got to keep the love in there. Yes. You got to keep the love. And so if you're a parent coaching somebody, if you're a boss leading a company, like you got to keep the love alive. Yes. Like and that's then, a priority. Absolutely. And I can tell that from the moment I walked in here yesterday because it's it's palpable, the culture that you've created here, because now you've created something where you you attract, like attracts like. So you've attracted people here that want to do things that way, that have an equal affinity and a love for the things that you are passionate about. And that's that's the thing I think businesses need to learn. You know, figure out your identity. Who are you and what is it you're trying to do? Let's collectively create some standards that if we all live up to these standards, we'll live this out. Let's have enough uh, compassion and care for each other that we hold each other accountable for these things and that will be our culture. And then when you have a great culture, you attract the type of people that wanna be here. And the mm -hmm. people that aren't a good fit, they're not going to last very long here. If one of them slips through the cracks, they're not going to last very long because they don't want to be around right. people that are in the on it culture, people yep. that are growing mentally and physically and emotionally, people that are all about pushing themselves and pushing limits. People are about serving others. You know, if you're a negative Nancy, you don't want to be around people doing that. No. So you'll just leave. Yeah. I mean, a, a parasite can't thrive in a in an <laughs> optimized immune system host. No, you know, absolutely. Like they want us, it wants to go to a weakened diseased then that's where it's going to flourish right yeah. and and someone with a parasitic mentality is going to want to find something that also is the right host yes for their mentality whereas Absolutely. the opposite will is true you know if you have a healthy organism and a healthy and all healthy tissue then yes it's going to support that and actually defend itself yes. naturally against those other inputs and, and yeah. we've seen that you know we've seen our organism expel splinters before anybody had to Absolutely. fire them. you know people are just like ah yeah i'm i'm out of here you for know sure. like I, I i appreciate what you guys are doing but it's not for me because i want to complain about my job and be a victim and go home yeah. and drink a lot and that's <laughs> not you know that's not really conducive doesn't fit here to no. here
And, and the higher your level of care and the higher level of trust you've built, then you can hold people to an even higher level of accountability. It, it's it's all proportionate to the depth of the trust and respect you've built. So again, like with your coach as an example, he doesn't he doesn't form that bond. You don't know that he truly cares about you as a human being off the court as much as he does. Like I'll care about you if you make this three. If right. you don't, maybe not so much then he's not able to hold you guys to the no. standards and the level of accountability that's required to win a playoff game or to win a state championship. So, you know, that's that's why the best coaches, I mean, yes, they get on their players and they're incredibly demanding. The best bosses do the same thing. You know, they're you love working for them, but they're really hard to please, but they've also created that relationship where you know they care about you and you know they want what's best for you mm -hmm. as well, not just for the team. So then it's, 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 it's that relationship. And, and some people are just missing that. They're so skewed on the other end of the, the seesaw that it can't it can't go up on the other side yeah i think you know people people power is like a it's a poor substitute for love mm -hmm. you know like love actually can compel right action you know but power is like the cancer causing artificial sweetener version yeah you know of how you make the cookie right yep. like it can have some of the same effects because it can get people to do stuff and, of course. and power, you know, using fear and power. And, you know, the coach had artificial power. He had the power to whether to play us or not to play us, yes. whether to leave us on the team or not leave us on the team or all of, all of this natural power based on his position, power that he didn't earn. He was given, yes. granted power. Yeah. And, and then he just used that with fear as mm -hmm. the motivator. But, you know, you see someone like Pete Carroll, all right, yeah, he was granted that job by... Mm -hmm you know by the team owners and right. whatever but he's also inculcating the love the love for him and the yes. love for like and even you know even you see like there's sons of other coaches that only that don't even have that kind of enthusiasm that he does but you can right. tell that the players like genuinely love and like phil jackson for Absolutely. example right like there was a true love even though he wasn't that same kind of like encouraging guy but right. there was just this level of respect and a mutual kind of love that you felt or pat riley or some of these other people that that were a little harder and you of know course. a little less but the players still played out of love absolutely you know and like and there was power there too but but really there's nothing that's going to motivate you or motivate anybody more than love like no. that is the force that drives the greatest action and love does not contain fear no. you know right like so to really maximize the amount of love you gotta really eliminate as much fear unnecessarily absolutely as you can. create a safe environment and that's yeah. what you need and that's the difference between having authority and actually being a leader if you're leading with love then that again the like attracts like you're gonna get people that will run through a brick wall for you because that it should have been the inverse. It should have been you wanted to make that shot so bad because you didn't want to let your coach down because he means that much he, to yeah, you. Yeah, because he gave me a Not, chance. Yes. And he was like really caring for me. And he was, how is it, you know, being a California guy in Texas moving in? And like, no, it's a lot. But, you know, know that you're going to get your chance. You're going to get multiple chances. You know, we're going to work with you and make sure. Yep. And if you're ready for this level, you're going to be here. Well, you know, it, that would have been a totally different experience. Absolutely. And I, I learned it as a young performance coach, but then I've translated that to business now, which is the golden rule of you connect first, you coach second. Has to be in that order. Mm -hmm. You can't, X's and O's mean nothing if we've not created any type of bond or connection. There's no trust. You don't know that I care about you. You don't know that I've got your back. I mean, ultimately that's the most important stuff. So, uh, and that would have been his best move. The day you moved to Texas would not have been, let me see if this kid can make a three or have any footwork. Let me hear a little bit about your journey. What brought you to Texas? Let yeah, me like yeah. bring you in and develop a relationship with you first. And then, then you'll develop that love where he can get hard. He, he can be hard on you and mm. he can hold you accountable and you'll be fine with that. But coaches skip that connection part and the connections were, and same with bosses. I mean, connect first, coach second. It has to be in that order. And, and then, you know, to transition to one of the other things you're saying is remove the outcome dependent yes. happiness sadness praise punishment right like that was one thing that you know one of my best friends and actually one of the the first person to put any money into on i raised like 100 grand to start on it and then i got 60 of that from bodie miller yep and so he was an olympic skier and national champion and one of the really unique things is he completely discarded the external validation of whether he won or not he mm -hmm. just literally only cared about how he skied yeah and if he skied the line that he wanted to ski yep 
and whether he was doing what he needed to do whether he trained the way he needed to train whether he you know sent it the way he wanted to send it and he had his all his own kind of rules around mm -hmm. what that meant you know and he knew what what would affect his performance and what wouldn't it wouldn't matter what people said people were like don't have any beers the night before yeah. you ski it'll fuck it he's like no i ski professional i'm actually yeah. the best skier ever to come through the united states yeah. like i actually know what affects my performance so yeah. i'm paying attention and these beers don't right so i'm gonna have them and i'm gonna ski and actually by the way fuck you because i don't care if i win or not i right. just care if i ski my if very fucking best absolutely you know and and coaches and everybody parents and whatever like it's not like that you know it's not like you go out and for the most part and play your best game or run your best campaign or do the best you can and it doesn't work which naturally is going to happen all of course the time it is. you know and you still like are enthusiastic about it like yeah we fucking really we, we sent it like we gave it our best we were on it you know like what? that that's that's true life yes and it's remarkable that that he was able to do that because that's an incredibly challenging skill especially someone that was in the public eye and had as many people looking at him as he did but now i'm a big believer feedback is inherently neutral mm -hmm. it's just it's it's sterile it's unbiased it's just feedback and it only becomes positive or negative or good or bad when we associate feelings with it so you have to learn how to depersonalize it which i'm making it sound incredibly easy it's not because yeah. we are human beings and we have feelings and emotions but yeah that's that's all that it is it's and no matter what that feedback is can i take whatever it is and find a way to use it to get better so if it is feedback that most people would consider good okay then i need to double down on that whatever i did for this performance down the slopes i need to continue to do that because it, it worked well for me i skied one of my best times mm -hmm. if i didn't all right let me unpack that let me go back what could i have done different what was in my control yeah. that i could have done to ski better next time and every time you're leveling up. So it really doesn't matter whether you win or lose. It matters whether you're paying attention to the feedback so that the next run down the slopes is better than the previous one. And it sounds like he's got that down pat where he could say, I can have three beers tonight and I will skate, uh, skate ski the best I've ever skied tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he knows that. And I've watched him do it. I don't doubt <laughs> you know, it. Like I've watched I know. him do it. And but that's it, incredibly impressive. It is, it is really impressive. And it's something like, all right, so let's apply this to, you know, my real athletic days are over i'm still yeah. like train and have fun and whatever but i don't have people watching me play which i miss by the way yeah it, is, it does suck not having anybody <laughs> watch you play and anybody give a shit but uh we can shoot some free throws after this i'll cheer yeah. for you <laughs> all right i yeah, got let's you do, let's do <laughs> um yeah so so one of the things so let's apply that let's apply that now like where do you get feedback that you're not willing to look well, at what? i can apply it to my life right now okay. so i'm a professional speaker so i speak to businesses yep. and at events and most of those, there's actually a feedback component. The attendees fill out a feedback form and they give it to me. So these people are going to say what they liked, what they didn't like, what they got out of it, what they didn't. And I'm getting much better at being able to take a beat and saying, first of all, this doesn't have anything to do with whether they like me or not. And that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I'm there to do a job. I'm there to add value to an audience by sharing with them things that I believe will help them be the best versions of themselves or improve their business. But let me take the feedback that I get from them and let's find what I can use. So if, if folks say, Hey, we like this, you know, you have great energy. Okay. Well, if that seems to be a common theme that a lot of people think is valuable to them, then my, my energy is probably something that I want to continue to maintain at a high level. If there's something else that I'm doing that may be distracting or a portion of content that they don't resonate with, it doesn't mean I throw it out because that's the other part too, about feedback you might have just had the worst morning of your life. You know, your grandmother passed away last night. Your, your, your dog was sick this morning. You got in a fender bender and you give me a scathing review as a speaker. That's probably more of a reflection of how your day's going than how I did. So I have to be very careful of that too. But I'm going to look for trends and I'm going to look for things and say, okay, if a lot of people are saying this, this might be something to take a look at and maybe make some improvements in the future. But you also have to be careful of where the feedback comes from. Because you have to know the difference between opinion and someone's technical skill. Like right. some guy off the street might not be qualified to tell me how to be a better professional speaker because he doesn't know what it means. To, he can say whether or not he liked me. That's his opinion. But feedback's a different thing. So I yeah. just try to remain, keep my eyes and ears well, and heart open to it. unbiased and your ego uninvolved. Absolutely. And that's like, I'm here to learn. Yes. I am here to learn, period. And you apply that to whatever the fuck you're doing. Absolutely. Oh, I'm CEO here to learn. I'm not God-given, granted from the Pharaoh's tit, right. you know, here to lead <laughs> Egypt to glory because I'm God too. And all of this 
crazy idea like you're here to learn you yeah. know, you learn and get better so take the feedback like, appreciate the feedback yeah. everybody's so everybody gets so obsessed and you know you hear so many people talking about the haters like well, who cares okay that's a yeah. type of feedback like well, absolutely and and a lot of times it, that is purely a reflection of them right yes. like i remember seven eight years ago i started talking about probably eight years ago really openly talking about ayahuasca yeah and the ritualized use of plant medicines yep for the benefit of spiritual psychic mental physical growth yep. you know and i remember when i would start talking about that on social media everybody would just not everybody lots of people like me you fucking druggie yeah. go back to the jungle you fucking druggie blah 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 i mean it's a pretty polarizing topic right and then a lot of people are like wow that's really interesting and blah 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 and so the people just calling me a fucking druggie like you can't worry about i didn't go right. hit them up and start a twitter war right. with these people you mean like, you're not going to change someone's <laughs> mind on social media right but but there was other people who would be like you know they would say intelligent things like yeah you know um you know just be mindful that mindful of the centers and mindful of the intentions of the shamans and don't yep. be careful of over promoting because there's a lot of people looking to take advantage you take feedback like that like oh yeah you're for sure I'm a, little, I'm a little enthusiastic about this i gotta really pre present both sides and actually now when i talk about it i'm as much in the discouraging side for sure as the encouraging side because there's so much natural encouragement like yeah fucking be careful and go to the right place and be mindful of all the things but but there's ways like feedback that you should ignore just recognize that you're triggering things in other people yeah. these people who have biases and are scared of their own you know demons in the shadows or whatever and the same thing that's happening now in an open relationship when i talk about open relationship i mean just get lit up for no reason online and you can't let that stuff bother bother you because again this is eight years ago me talking about ayahuasca i was a fucking druggie right now you know i'm a fucking everything right you know and then eight years from now all right we'll see but you you trust your truth and yes. like you know you know what you're talking about and you listen to people and you yes. understand and respect and and get that but it doesn't have to bother you right but i imagine that was was that a difficult process for you to get to to the point where it didn't bother okay, you okay so about that it wasn't right because that was like um but Would, areas where I'm, I'm a little areas where i'm a little insecure mm -hmm. those are the areas where i take it i take it it hurts of course right so like one <laughs> so one of the things that, that i'll just use a, a fairly recent example one of the things that i got in i was insecure about and this was like maybe two three years ago something like that i have a lot of friends who are comedians and they're really fucking funny yeah they're just like funny like this and so i was a little i'm on all these podcasts with all these comedians and i was like starting to get insecure that i'm not funny enough <laughs> to, to be on these podcasts right and so like somebody came up and i was on a comedian's podcast and somebody started talking about how not funny i was oh. and that one like that, that, stung. One, that, one, that stung. one stung for a little bit that one yeah. stung because it, it i agreed yeah i agreed but with that's what, what they is. were saying yeah. right and so it was like oh yeah i am not funny enough but if i didn't have that mentality and like now i acknowledge and part of like getting over this is acknowledging where you're insecure yeah and acknowledging what who you are and not needing i don't need to be funny with the self-awareness just self-awareness be like yeah yeah all right I, you know i'm not as funny as these fucking guys right that's okay they're professional comedians they're, they're comedians yeah. they're hilarious that's awesome I, I don't need to be that i like to follow things up with just so so yeah i'm not that funny so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a lot of the stuff. I mean, a lot of the stuff I picked up at, at your weekend in uh, in Santa Monica. You know, I'll tell folks I've been doing the cold showers. Haven't missed a cold shower since Santa Monica. Amazing. And it's and I still don't enjoy them by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> no. But I love how they feel when I get out. But I'll I'll tell someone I'm doing that, and they'll say, "No, I can't do that. It's just too cold. It's cold." I'm like, "Yeah, so it's cold, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you intermittent fast, right. so you're a little hungry in the morning. So? so so you're a little hungry. Like why why does just because you're hungry mean that you have like, I don't understand. So, and, and for me, that's been a liberating mindset with some of these things is we, we have these mental constructs. It's like, oh, well, if I'm hungry, then I absolutely have to eat. Or if mm -hmm. that water's a little bit too cold, then I have to make it warmer. I'm not funny. Oh, I'm going to go take an improv class because I have to be funnier. Why? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the, you know, if you're going to put any characteristic of like, all right, like what makes Aubrey, Aubrey mm -hmm. and like, I think it is the characteristic of looking at something I'm fucking terrified of mm -hmm. and recognizing that, okay, there's benefit actually if I go through this, whether that's a really intense plant medicine ceremony or switching from, you know, 
a very comfortable monogamy to a very scary open relationship or or whatever or a really intense sweat lodge or the cold shower cold plunge or whatever making you do an open mic at yeah, comedy open club. mic or whatever yeah i am I actually am planning to do that <laughs> oh awesome Good because for you. i'm because i am a little scared of i know that, right but i so love like, that so, you go head first so the it's just understanding like it's it's asking that question like so all right so i'm a little scared so i know there's value yes. in the transcension of that fear there always is if you have fear that's not like actual danger i'm not putting my hand in a right fucking tank of black scorpions you yes. know like that's actual danger don't do that not smart you know but you know i need to get over my other fears and if one of my fears is not being funny well then come up with a couple bits and go to an open mic Absolutely. like for sure have to do that and i think that's and because i know there'll be value there and i know that will. yeah you know even the process of self-judgment and even that process of self-reflection and even showing up the next wherever the medicine comes it's going to come yeah it's going to come at some point from me overcoming that fear so you almost start to switch the whole way you look if you're like oh cool yes. i have a fear around this thing oh cool gives me something else to tackle. gives me something it's else a, that's going to be another yes. springboard new to an even better version of myself and i know myself i know that when i see that it's going to be like yeah, yeah yeah and it's it's actually it's interesting and i and i have all the compassion for people who have a different mentality but it's funny when people have a sticking point yeah it could be singing or it could be you know speaking in public or it could be that is whatever it's it's like a it's an interesting thing I'm like no no i'm too scared of that and you're like but you could just do it yep but you could do it you know or i'm scared of the cold y yeah Mm -hmm. you could but you could do it absolutely <laughs> you know like you're capable but it's because it, they're convincing everybody's convincing themselves that they don't have that superpower right to overcome these things that they know would be beneficial if they overcame absolutely and i find that fascinating you know so brad in here is an incredible endurance athlete and he's the, i've already seen him do some remarkable stuff but one of the things i'm a hurdle i'm trying to cross over is i do have some limiting beliefs i have some some initial negative self-talk he was saying he was considering doing a hundred mile road race, like running on his feet for a hundred miles. And the first thought that popped in my mind was like, I can't do that. And then I'm like, that's not a good mindset to have. But you see, might for be me, right, but it's still, it's right, still might but not be the right I need to find mindset. out, right, but I need to find out. <laughs> yeah. But see, my mindset now is if every day, if I'm doing a little bit of something that I, I fear, and fear might not be the right word, but a cold shower sure. or the intermittent fasting or doing some of these other things, I'm going to slowly over time, brick by brick, condition myself to be able to beat that mindset. And you are right. I might not be able to run 100 miles. But why would I give up before I've even given it a chance? Sure. And that's what I'm worried about myself is that's the mindset that I have. So I'm I'm trying to find a way to kind of inch closer to that. So at the very least, when he tells me something crazy he's going to do, my initial reaction is I can't do that. It's going to be, okay, let me consider that or I'm going to do that too. But I think these little step forwards uh, are a huge help. So Because they apply universally. You yes. Know, like people, you got to look at love as a universal and fear as a universal and any little way that you can increase love increases your love universally yes. right like you love a pet a lot yeah like that's going to increase how much you love your wife absolutely like it's just because love is universal the more love you feel you know the more love you're going to have absolutely and the more fear that you have the more fear you're going to have universally the more fear you're going to have that your wife's going to leave you yep. if you're afraid of fucking cold showers right like absolutely fear and love are universal things and we got to understand that our goal is to start to tackle and conquer the unnecessary fear now this is not again recognition of danger everybody tries to of call, course oh of course fear is important man yeah right. i got it understand yeah. it's help us recognize danger. it's a cold shower i'm not it's fighting not a rabid <laughs> wolverine yeah, yeah, yeah exactly it's, yeah. it's a cold shower bro yeah. it's healthy for you <laughs> yeah absolutely you know, like it's a, that's the type of fear yeah. that i'm talking about it's not sharks in the water it's <laughs> yeah. a shower i got you yeah <laughs> yeah so you know but as you start to tackle and you start to shrink the universal fear and expand the universal love i mean i'm feeling the effects of that like For i sure it's happening and everything gets a little bit more rosy colored and the fear has a little a few less fucking spiders and yes. barbed wire and stings to it because there's just less of it yes there's less of it out there and you prime your day like all right i start my day doing a couple things i don't really want to do right. but i did it and there's going to be a few more things today that i don't want to do but oh well throw them on the pile taking and a pebble so, out of the fear pile yes and, and putting it on the other side the, yeah throwing it in the volcano to be emulsified in love absolutely and create some momentum yeah and that's what i mean basketball is a game of momentum Life's life a is momentum. a fucking game of, of momentum. course it and is. that's another thing i was talking about recently on these cold showers like we need pattern interrupts mm -hmm. you know so 
even in basketball, like when a coach calls a timeout, you know, like a well-timed timeout is a pattern interrupt. Yes. Like if a team is like starting to like really heat up, better to call the timeout before the fucking place goes Absolutely. bananas. And then yes. it makes it even worse. And then everybody's just partying for <laughs> two minutes as the timeout's there, like just getting more excited. Like right. call that timeout a little earlier, yep. you know, like stop them before the run, like have your instincts there and have that little pattern interrupt. So yes. before you get back to your whatever situation where you're gonna be frothing angry and yes. pissed off and shitty with people and then have to spend the next fucking week or seven years of your life apologizing for being a shithead, yes. well maybe try the pattern interrupt a little earlier. Call your own timeout, do your cold shower and your breathing or your yes. hard workout or your sauna first as a little pattern interrupt. And like we need that, teams need that, everybody needs that because momentum can carry you. Yes. The algorithm that is organism can take over and all of those things can just build and you'll just blow up if you don't call your own time out. Yes. You know, and find those tools that you can to, to kind of break that up. And you'd end the run quickly. The other team's going on a run and you call time out. Yep. And you just casually bring the team over and say, hey, they're going on a little bit of a heater. We're going to nip this in the bud before like there's no, but what do most coaches do? They wait till it extends. Now you're down 15. You call a timeout and you berate your players for 90 seconds. Tell them how awful they are. And then yeah. you send them out with less confidence than they had before. <laughs> yeah. You did nothing to prepare them to do anything better. You've made it worse. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's awful. And, but that's and, how most coaches use the them. other team is like, oh yeah, we got them on the ropes now. Look, we, had, yeah. we yeah. made them call a timeout. Look how red his face is. Look at him. <laughs> he's screaming at him. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, and that's the, you know, those are all patterns that you can learn in sports mm -hmm. and then apply to our own life. Yeah. yeah. I tell businesses all the time, like it's important if, if you have regular set meetings throughout the week, first of all, I think most companies have way too many meetings. Mm -hmm. I mean, way too many meetings. They're colossal wastes of time. And I always tell them they should view meetings the way basketball coaches view timeouts. First of all, you're given a finite number of them. So you can't have unlimited meetings. Like you get X number of timeouts this game. Yep. If you use them all in the first quarter, that's on you. Then you don't have any <laughs> later. So be strategic about it. Second, let's make sure we have an incredibly detailed plan because we only have 90 seconds or 30 seconds to execute this. So this is not going to be an open-ended 60-minute all-hands-on staff meeting. This is going to be only the people that need to be here are going to be here. And we're going to keep this meeting as brief and as purposeful as possible. And then what's so important is you want to make sure everyone leaves the meeting in the emotional state that you want them to return to whatever it is they were going to do. Mm -hmm. So you don't berate your players before you send them back out on the court. Now they go out there with their, their tail between their legs. It's, it's worse. Coaches mess that up all the time with their halftime talks. The best time to get on your team and be highly critical is when you're playing really well because the collective confidence is high. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be rather bulletproof to it. So you just had an amazing first half, Aubrey. You played great. I can get on you about the two possessions where you didn't box out. Cause you're mm -hmm. going to be open to that now, yep. as opposed to you just went zero for nine. You had the worst half ever. You're already, you know, you've already been beaten down and I'm going to come in there and scream and F bomb you and make you feel worse. No, get on your team more with higher scrutiny when they're playing well, and then give them the care and the love when they're not doing well. So you can return them to that state. Same thing in business, but people, they, they keep getting those things backwards every time. Yeah. And it's, it's a shame. <laughs> I remember one, uh, I remember one halftime. This reminds me of this one halftime. Our coach goes in and he goes, he tells, he tells one of our players who's having a bad, had a bad first half goes, if I were your fucking family, I would disown you. Right. And he goes on this fucking rampage. Right. And like, all of us are like, what the fuck? Like wow. that is like ridiculous. Like if I was your school, if I was the school, I would expel you. If I was your family, I would disown yeah. you and I should just kick you off the team right now. And I was like, that's got to help. That, that really, that really helped. Yeah. We, we went yeah. out and killed it that second half. You know, we were, our spirits were really high. We didn't have any fear in our system. You know, we were yeah. playing out of love there. I mean, a good job. That there's was so really many good. other ways you can approach that, Yeah, you know? And again, it's all to the level of trust and care you've built. So again, and it, it's also about knowing your team. So if I know your personality and I can say something, you know, hey, Aubrey, yeah, great first half, man. You got one more rebound than me and I'm wearing a suit and tie. Like, you, think, <laughs> you think you can get a few more rebounds this yeah, next yeah, half? Yeah. Come on, man. I know you got it in you. Yeah. You were a dog in practice yesterday. I know you got this. Imagine yeah. that versus I'm going to disown you. Like it's night and day on how night you're going to get someone to respond. And it also, it changes the patterns. Like parents who are, Parents who punish their over punish their kids, you know what they do is they create a bunch of fucking liars. 
Yeah. You know, like you create a bunch of Absolutely. fucking corner cutting, you know, appearance giving, lying motherfucking kids. Yes. Good job. Now you've broken the trust bond because yes. they're not going to tell you shit. No. They're going to be sneaking out every chance they get. Yes. They're not going to talk to you about, hey, should I do these drugs or not do these drugs? Right. Because if you talk about drugs, you're grounded for a fucking rest of your life anyway. So yep. you've just created a really antithetical situation. You think you're being a good parent. You're going to pat yourself on the back. Nope. You're being an asshole. Yeah. You know, like, because you're your kids now can't trust you for guidance in life so who are they going to go to i don't know their other homies yes you know who don't know shit anyways well, either and and so i'm going to praise you when you get an a but i'm going to berate you when you get a c or a d i'm not going to ask any questions about whether or not yeah. you, you so what now you're going to cheat because i'm going to sure. copy off this kid's paper so i can get an a so my dad's Cheating, not going to come down and figuring out whatever yes. whatever way to create the positive outcome because because that's all so that i've fear. shown that matters yeah. is the outcome you've put so much fear into the fucking system you know like and it's just building that mountain and that mountain is going to play out into, into their family life into their professional life into the their, their whole thing they're going to have these patterns of mistrust and lying and and it's going to project eternally yeah you know and, and like we just the, there's very simple principles but meanwhile what we're talking about in school is remembering the date that some fucking treaty of versailles was signed or mm -hmm. some shit like that matters like i can't google that shit anytime i want to fucking figure it out you know how long it takes yeah. me i don't know as long as it takes me to fucking type it in my phone yes. I, got, I, I got this shit and i don't I'm, even and know I'm, when the date is and i'm 43 and you know how many times someone has asked me that <laughs> since i graduated yeah zero this. but yeah. how about like communication and love right. and fear and like not having None shame, not being ashamed to yeah. look at your mistakes because you're not going to punish yourself because you haven't internalized this yes. world self-critical conditional love bullshit yep. so that you can actually look at when you screw up and be like, oh yeah, I screwed up. Cool. I'll be better next time because I'm here to learn. Yes. And that's the only thing I'm responsible for is doing my best and learning. That's all that matters. But same thing, if you're my son and you come home and you have an A, a few Bs and Cs, and then an F, most parents are going to be focused on the F and going to yeah. say, okay, now we need to get tutors. You're grounded. We're going to do something to get this. Why pay attention to that? Why don't we look at the A that you got? Let me see what subject you got an A because one, you probably like it. Two, you probably have a natural talent for it. So why don't I find something to double down and improve the thing that you're already showing something that you're good at instead of yeah. focusing on, you the know, bad. for me as a parent, as long as it's not out of disrespect, as long as my kids are respectful and they do what they're supposed to do, I'm not too worried about the grades portion. That stuff will all figure it. It'll all just figure itself out if they do what they're supposed to do. And if they have this mindset where they're open to learn, the learning is way more important than whether you can regurgitate it on a test. That part is irrelevant, yeah. but that's the outcome. When, so like, just know asked, you have to learn. When we ask like, how'd you do? You know, we're really like, no, did you win, did you lose? Yes. Really the two questions we should ask any athlete or, you know, or I want to hear these because I've got like, four. You have four? Yes, that I, tell, I ask my kids all the time, yeah. but I want to hear what yours well, are. Well, I think really the two things are, did you do your best? Mm -hmm, that was one of them. And did you learn? I love it. And like, and like should also probably, did you enjoy yourself? You know, yeah, like okay. Well then you're, yeah, you've got one. my list. So I've got eight year old twin sons and a six year old yeah. daughter. My four rules are one, make sure you listen to your coaches mm -hmm. Two, make sure you're a good teammate, which at their age, it's kind of like, Hey, make somebody else smile. Give somebody a high five. Three, did you have fun? Mm -hmm. And four, did you give your best effort? As long as you do those four things, I'll keep paying for it. I'll keep Ubering you there. I'll keep doing everything I can to support you. If you're not going to do those four things, yeah. then, then there's no point in doing this. Yeah. But the funny thing is, if you do those four things, if you're coachable, if you serve your teammates, if you have fun and you do the best you can, you'll end up being the best player you can be. Mm -hmm. Like that's the recipe. Well, but we're not, we're teaching not, you, you're teaching you yourself life. Yes. Using sports as the metaphor yes. to teach you about life. Do your best, learn always. Yes. And just have fun. Enjoy because the if process. That's the only thing that you're worried about is doing your best and yeah. learning. Why wouldn't you have fun? Because these sports are designed to be awesome. They weren't designed for no. pre, you know all this crazy pressure and perform. They were designed because people were bored and they were like, "This would be awesome. Let's put up a peach basket and yes. try to make it in there." And then we'll, we'll have to go get it out of the basket, you know, eventually. But yeah, you know, it'll still be fucking fun in the meantime. Absolutely. And how many games have we invented like that? Find a little, you know, we used to throw my brother was a football player. We used to throw his little cleats in this wooden chalice that somehow made its way to my family. Maybe it was lathed from his wood class, and we'd spend like thirty minutes throwing cleats across the room yep. into this 
this little chalice, and that was our fucking cleats in the blast. hole. Cleats yeah. in the hole was like our family game. Cleats right? in the but hole. But imagine if we made cleats yeah. in the hole a performance thing, where like our dad was like yelling at us, yes. like, yeah, how dare you miss that cleat in the hole?" <laughs> wow, you know, like it would just ruin the whole thing. When all sports were like that, they're fun, so you should have fun. Just do your best and learn. Should be the point. Yeah. Wow. My mom was nasty at cleats in the hole. By was the way, she? she was. She was just nasty she got it done. at cleats. She could just rip them. Wow, just rip them from deep. I love it. She can also catch a cork. I don't know. I posted this a couple times. Yes, I've she seen can that. Catch a cork. I saw that. I can't get anybody to reproduce that myself. Like the it works every time. She's I'll like an outfielder. <laughs> like the, yeah, the, the eye and coordination. I saw you put yeah, that on G. Just, that was she amazing. Left hand, she just grabbed a full extension left hand cork grab. That thing comes out like a bullet. It does. Yeah, she's gangster. That's pretty dope, man. Man, it's great to have you, brother. Yes, thank your you book, so much. Yes. Raise your game. Came out yesterday. Oh shit. Yes. How well, sick it won't is that? be yesterday when the podcast comes out. It came out three and a half weeks ago. <laughs> Let's hold that up. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. That's awesome, man. I appreciate and, it. And um follow you on all the social. What's your social handle? Uh, at Alan Stein Jr. Beautiful. Easy to find. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. It's yes, a pleasure man. to have you out in Santa Monica too. And uh, yeah. look forward to continuing the relationship, man. And let's try to get in the hardwood here. Soon. Appreciate you. That'd be great. Yep. Thanks. See you, everybody. Peace. Thank you.